inclusion in, in society. We are a nonprofit, sectarian, nonpartisan organization, meaning that we have people from different backgrounds. You don't have to be liberal, conservative, Republican, Democrat, you know, religious or not, it's open to everyone. So you don't even have to be Hispanic to be part of Spanish United. You know, we have allies that support us and we've been going strong for the last three years. Uh, our purpose. Spanish United is a beacon of hope for the Hispanic community and to raise, train, and educate civil leaders who can lead by example and bring necessary reforms to the Hispanic community. Uh, because sadly, many Hispanics have gone astray and uh, many have gone to dark past, and we are to provide an alternative and to break the negative stereotypes of Hispanics. Because of, because of the climate that we've been going through the last couple of years with uh, different past administrations, there is a very strong Hispanophobia, or what that is, you know, anti, anti Hispanic sentiment, which is happening right now against the Hispanic community because of the immigrant immigration. So one of the things that we do is that we try to advocate and change the perception image of Hispanic people, that we are educated people, that we're productive people, that we are people that contribute to society. So we try to dispel the myths that people have of Hispanic people. So that's what we do. We try to educate and to try to educate people on what Hispanic is and that we are wanting to be part of mainstream, mainstream society. Our mission, Spanish United is involved in community work. We believe in that in order to gain respect, we must earn respect. And by doing volunteer work, our set the example to others and to do our best in trying to house homeless people, which we do a lot of community work as well, regardless of their racial or ethnic background. We believe in working together, we can end homelessness and eradicate poverty from our communities, from our, from our communities, and from our neighborhoods. Like right now, what's happening really bad in our state in California in particular is that the homeless epidemic is very bad. And uh, it's gotten to the point that it's creating, in many, in many instances, social instability. Like homeless people used to be congregated or segregated in just one particular area. But now homeless people have done encampments now in people's homes and schools and businesses, and it's causing a lot of problems. So. One of the things that we're trying to do is to get volunteers, to get people to get involved, to get motivated, because you know we need to do what we can to end homelessness because it is a very crisis right now, especially in the state of California. So, you know, we're trying to get volunteers. You know, doesn't matter what background you are, to try to help house the homeless, to provide services, to provide. Uh, Materials like right now, since it's going, to, it's going to be winter soon, a lot of homeless people need warm things to cover themselves. You know, a lot of homeless people have like, you know, food and whatever, but they need sanitation stuff like diapers, like uh, clothing, because they cannot bathe themselves or take care of themselves. So this is where we come in to try to provide as many homeless people, especially those that are Hispanic. They don't really know the system. They don't know where to have access. Many of them don't even have transportation. So this is where we come in to go into the community to try to help people on an individual basis. Uh, what else? Resolve income and inequality. This is a big issue here. One of the concerns of Spanish United is a large income inequality between other ethnic groups like Asian Americans, for example, who represent only 6% of the population, but they have incomes much higher than Hispanic Americans who are 18% of the population. Hispanics are the largest minority in this country, but yet we are invisible and we are underrepresented in many aspects in terms of education, economics, and, and political representation. Crime and poverty, unfortunately, are in, inseparable and, uh, and are a symptom of a larger problem and in order to have social stability, Hispanics need to raise their living standards to that of Asian Americans in order to prevent crime and civil unrest among Hispanics. Like, similar to what's happening in Europe right now, when you have a migrant crisis from many Islamic and Muslim countries, you are having an issue with Hispanic people that are coming across the border, legal or illegal. And a big concern that many people have is that if many of these Hispanics don't assimilate 
or have the same um, standard of, of uh, living or income as other established groups. There is a concern of social instability, and I think that would be very dangerous, not only for Hispanic community, but for other countries as well. So, you know, we're trying to establish workshops where we could uh, educate a lot of the younger people in going to school and educating the adults to emphasize and to promote their children to get an education because today having a, min a minimum wage job, it's fine, it's honorable, but it's not something that you pass on to your children and to your children's children. That's something you do temporarily. So, you know, we're trying to experiment and doing a pilot program. We can uh, do a workshop where we could get, you know, young families with young children or even just young adults that may have no direction in life to educate them and at the same time educate them on how to be productive educated citizens because many Hispanic people because of circumstances they may not know how to deal with certain situations and our focus is to get Hispanic people to be educated to be productive so that way they could have the right tools to succeed One of our goals, a long-term goal of Spanish United, has been to build a community center where Hispanics can not only benefit from social services, but provide tutoring, recreational activities, senior services, college preparatory exams, senior services, and English and Spanish language where Hispanic people can have a place where they can feel safe and not be ashamed of who they are or where they come from. One of our long-term goals of Spanish United is eventually once we get ourselves more established, getting sponsorship and getting uh, resources is to establish eventually um, a community center. Because I've spoken to many Hispanic people in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Miami, in the South Bronx, in Chicago. They all say every other ethnic group, every other group of people have community centers except for us. And there's a lot of need which the Hispanic community could have, but because of lack of resources, the lack of investment. Uh, we don't have community centers that are specifically for Hispanic people. Like, for example, over in the San Gabriel area, the, the Chinese community have community centers for their own people. It's open to everybody, but they have centers for their own people. The Persians have it, the Armenians have it, but Hispanic people, for some reason, are the only missing in this country, which we don't have social services for our own people. And that is a concern because Many Hispanic people, especially the younger people, are more prone into getting into the lure of temptation of gangs and drugs and have a higher chance of getting incarcerated if they don't have these services as a safeguard. Like when I was growing up in the 80s and the 90s, we had there in the Boys and Girls Club. My, my, my generation is pretty much drug free because we were taught that drugs were bad, gangs were bad, guns were bad. But the generation after me doesn't have that. So we want to try to bring that back again. And I think that will help in preventing the stigmatization of Hispanic people. At the same time, Hispanic people can learn to give back to the community. And we can provide a service to the community at large. And if anyone is interested in joining Spanish United, we are all on social media platforms. So everyone wants to make a donation and do it via, via PayPal or Cash App. Anything you give is tax deductible. Uh, you could also give cash check if you want. And every proceed that you give goes directly to help homeless people, to help the, the Hispanic people, and the same time to provide a service for many people that are vulnerable and in need right now. So I want to thank you very much. And I'm going to be going to the next phase which is I'm going to be introducing my, uh, my team. So, phone fall down again. <laughs> One second. We'll see everything very clearly. Um, uh, you need a little more light, Ricky. Yeah, I know, but uh, for some reason, it's not, it's not letting me through. 
we turn the, I think we need to turn it off so that he can get it. Well, no, because you know I'm I'm gonna be doing a quick panel real quick for a, a few for a few minutes. So uh, we can turn more lights off if uh, on if you want. Just sit there. You'll see this screen, I think. I'm going to be introducing uh, my team, my directors that I have in different chapters. Can we turn the overhead light up here? Uh, yeah, sure. Turn them off? Yeah. Just the front. That's what I just said. And he, yeah? Yeah, okay. sure. I'm going to turn these off. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Just bear with me. The stream starts. We saw his face. Invisible man. Oh, no. Does that work? No. 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 Check your speakers. Yeah, that's what I'm going. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah, this is my uh, my my team, so I'm going to formally be introducing them. Huh. Can they see us? Uh, they can see us. But I wonder why the volume's not working. The volume should be up. That's your microphone. Can you guys hear me at all? Can you hear me? Are you hooked up to anything? Uh, Are you yeah, I, sh anything? I should be on. Is that the mixer? Are you hooked up to that mixer? Uh, yeah. That's probably why I can't hear you. If you could help, if you could help out with that, I would really appreciate it. <laughs> probably no more now than that. Hold and say something. Okay. Say something now. Are you able to hear me at all? Okay. They're there, I but... I don't know which... Uh, I honestly do not know which... Okay, yeah. I'm just going to put on a bunch of them. Let's try it again. Careful, doesn't it? No idea of what I'm doing. Uh, I'm going to call back. Are you guys able to hear me? Settings? No, I did not. So maybe I have to do that. Uh, you get to your get to your sound settings. We're having some difficult technical difficulties. So just give me a second. Mm -hmm. hooked up to our system. Yeah. Well, yeah, the issue is the sound. Yep. Not unless this is not where it's supposed to go. If 
I don't know why the sound's not working. Mm -hmm. Speakers seem to be on. Let me just double check. Yeah. That. Are you sure you're hooked up to this? Yeah, I'm, I'm hooked up. So many, so many possible things that could be wrong. It's just, Is it Discord? Really no, it's uh, it's uh, Facebook. Uh, who set all this up? Uh, it was already set up here. They just told me to just connect. Unless that's involved. You know what? Let me disconnect again. Let me call again. Maybe that's for the microphone. Try it. I don't know which, uh, which channels he's on. It says, please allow camera. Okay. Um, is this hooked up to nothing? Uh, yeah. Yeah, man, to put oh, okay. it up again. Put that somewhere that goes to your computer. It says they're connected to microphone audio. Mm -hmm. Are you able to hear me? They can hear you. You can see. You can see it. I uh, can see them. I I I, I can see, see the them microphone on. on the bottom, which is going. But you can't hear them because you're not hooked up to any sound. So. Uh, so and you have to. As I said, um, I think you might have to do a new place. In, in the cord, maybe that. No. Oh, you're hooked up now? Yeah. I'm, now okay. you have to go to your sound settings. All right. So let me go to sound settings. I have no idea which. <laughs> but this whole thing would be muted. Oh, you're going to have a mixer like this. You're going to have something. Yeah, absolutely. Nothing here is muted. Sound mixer, okay. okay. All right, so it says they're setting up microphones. Should I go there? Don't worry, click on it. says your microphone speaker. Speaker, okay. Like, like open speaker. Yeah, you have to find out what your speaker is. Open. I assume they need, uh, okay, I have been an audio device. I think that's uh, HDMI. So, do I just move it here or should I go here? Let's see what happens if I put a speaker headphone. Okay. Uh, okay. I got him to okay, join. Okay. All right, as, we, as did as it. As we did it. Okay. Okay. Let's go. Okay, okay. I didn't right. Thank you so much for being, on, being online, guys. There were technical difficulties. All right. So, this is my team. These are my these are my direct. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Please don't do this. I had to I had to come in here so I can do what I need to do on here. I did. I did. You call. Just give me like just give me like thirty minutes. All right. Okay. All right. Go ahead, y'all. Go ahead. It's good. It's cool. Okay. Welcome, welcome. Yes. And this is my team. As you know, with every organization has to have a team. So these are my directors from each of their chapters. So Robert is going to go with you. You have two minutes to speak. Introduce yourself to the audience. Okay. My name is Rob Serrano. I'm, I'm an administrator. I mean, I'm the director of um, New York chapter. New York chapter. And I'm upstate New York. Welcome. So tell the audience and, uh, uh, what is it that, that you do in your particular chapter's management. I uh, pass out flyers. I, I talk to people. Sometimes I give out a. Donations, and I explain to, and I explain to people what this uh, this leading to a little organization is about, and we're trying to you know improve. And uh, you, uh, I introduce yourself, please. Okay, my name is Ivan Kahan. I'm I'm an active um, admin admin and leader of my chapter here in Houston. Houston, Texas. 
Although I do have some connections in Louisiana that I'm also working with, but my main title is the Houston uh, or Texas chapter of Spanish United. Perfect. And can you explain um, what you're doing what I do is my focus is more like like traditional word of mouth, and my main my main focus, at least for my chapter, is given that I see in Texas, I'm trying to help organize and utilize humanity through a mixture of practical historical accounts. Texas being historical here in this lovely country where a lot of Hispanic old current and modern history happens. So I'm trying to utilize my skills as, as a historian at heart and also practical solutions to help my specific community here in Texas. And I also try to cater and focus to the youth and find ways to reach out to them to, t uh, to, to teach them about their history as well as keeping up with the times you know, for the, for the sake so of progress. Thank you. And finally, you, Eros. Amazing, amazing. Hello, everyone. My name is Eros Gonzalez. I'm the director of the Miami chapter of Spanish United. You know, I'm very, I'm, I, don't, I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but I'm assuming, you know, there might be a couple eyes on us right now. And I'm yes, very happy like that Enrique is actually, yeah, I'm very happy that Enrique is actually, you know, getting the community together and, and you know, and, and really meeting with uh, many leaders from, from the local community down in uh, in California, and um, you know one of the things that I wanted to say, and you know, Enrique was really he was really the man that conceptualized Spanish United, and he's the one that brought us all together. And one of the things that I really liked was his choice of name of the organization, Spanish United. And the reason why I like it so much because the key word in that in that name to me is United, and it's um it, you know just listening to that name. I don't know if this happens to you guys that are listening to me right now, but that name itself, Spanish United, it prompts a question in my mind. Um, what is the question? The question is, what unites us, right? What unites us as Spanish people, as Hispanic people, as Latino, whatever you like to, whatever whatever uh, term you like to use best. And um, and I, I think that, you know, I think the answer lies, um, some people may, may answer and they might think that, okay, well, it's the language that unites you guys. You know, you guys, Mexico, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Colombia, you all, you guys all speak Spanish. And, you know, and I've asked myself this question as well. I'm like, could it really just be the language that unites us? Is there anything else that can possibly bring us together as a, as a, as a people, right? And, um, and the conclusion that I've come to is that, um, to me, it's much more than just language. To me, it's a, a shared historical memory. It's a, it's a common heritage. And even though we do come from different countries with different uh, regional differences and, and different cultural nuances, right? Um, I think that beneath all that, we have a common heritage. We have a shared history spanning 500 years here in the Americas. And, um, and I think that as Hispanics, when we really emphasize that point, right, of our common history, our common heritage, that, that's, that really comes back from one major source, um, I think that's when we can really unite as Hispanic people. And, and, and more to my point, I think that really involves reclaiming our history and, and also, um, you know, acknowledging, yes, acknowledging some of the, you know, unfortunate parts of our history, which is not unique to Hispanic people. I think, you know, um, everybody, you know, um, you know, every group of people, you know, there's things to say, good things to say about. You know, there's things that we can improve on and we can learn from and move on, right? So, um, so uh, despite that, you know, I think that one of the, one of the main ideas is reclaiming our, our history in a wholesome manner and, and engaging with it in, in a very healthy way, you know, and, uh, and embracing you know, it. Yeah, it's fine. Well, you have to go to the point. Yeah, you have to
if I, he Googled me, I got Googled. I didn't feel a thing. Um, and uh, he invited me here today. They wanted me to talk about um, how the, the Jewish and Hispanic communities have uh, worked together in the past and how we can work together in the future, making uh, especially in areas of justice. Um, well, first of all, one of the things that I do need to emphasize is that, uh, you know, just as just as the Hispanic community is incredibly diverse, the Jewish community is also incredibly diverse. Um, we were just talking before I came up here about the cultural assumptions that we often make on each other. Right? Um, the, the assumption that Jews are white, the assumption that, Lat that Latinos or Hispanics are persons of color, as it were, mm. when we know that Jews and Hispanics can be of mm. any hue and of any race. And indeed, a multiple us It's a fast. I mean, I can which is 2,000 years as a legal system and as organized principles that hold over 30,000 years. I don't know what kind of advice I could possibly have for a Hispanic community of more than 600 million people. Um, and they are vastly more diverse than uh, financial. Than even the Jewish community is. There are, uh, I think, it should also be, uh, I think one of the things I want to emphasize is that, you know, we, one of the cultural assumptions we make is that Jews are not. <laughs> right? Exactly. Are, 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 right? Am I right? Exactly. Um, and uh, and I, I say this as a person, my wife is a Mexican American Jew by choice. Um, and there have been, uh, we, we know there have been many. Very famous uh, uh, Latino Jews out there, uh, Don Francisco being yeah. among them. I know Salvador Gigante, can you believe it? He's Jewish. Geraldo okay. Rivera. Geraldo Rivera. And let's not forget the most important super Jewish super couple on earth, Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo. Um, and the next president, it looks like the next president of Mexico is going to be a Jewish woman. Yes. Um, wow. It should also be not understood that uh, this is. Uh, started to get more known. The 600, uh, there are 600 million uh, Latinos. Um, I'm using the term Latinos this time because I mean to include those who live in Brazil who are not Hispanic. They are, right? Lucy, they are Latino. Um, but there's about 600, I don't know how many Hispanics there are, but I know there are 600 million Latinos. 150 million of these Latinos have at least 5% Jewish DNA, Sephardic Jewish DNA. And the first, the first Jews who came to the Americas were all Sephardic Jews, and many of them were Sephardic crypto Jews, which has which uh, had a very complex relationship with the Spaniards. Um, there's a story about a, a Mexico City, a Mexico City conquistador who was burned at the stake because he was secretly practicing Judaism. Um, it was said that in the 18th century, about one third of the population of Mexico City was crypto Jewish. Uh, we do not know how many crypto Jews there are, but we do know that 150 million Latinos have Sephardic Jewish DNA. So to uh, to to say that you got Latinos over this silo and Jews over this silo, silo probably I keep going back and forth. The Jewish not a problem. It's uh, I think that's that's a myth that we just need to explode. Okay, um, and I think I think it's it's really important. I've been thinking about all the amazing Jewish organizational um, organizations. And I do see echoes of that in the Latino world. There's MALDA, the Mexican American Legal Defense uh, and Education Fund, which is very similar, parallel to the Anti-Defamation League, uh, which uh, fight, which is mostly Jewish organization that fights anti-Semitism and other forms of bigotry. Um, and you have, uh, I think it's called the Latino uh, I don't know, the Federation or the United Latino Fund. I think it's called the Latino Latino Association. Uh, Lulek, and you have the United Jewish Appeal and the Jewish Federations. Um, these are organizational uh, activities to kind of bring everybody together and, and try to uh, raise funds for the needs of their community. So as uh, in in the early uh, quick five-minute Guido Sarducci University here, because I know we uh, we don't have a great deal of time, um, the first Jews that came to the United States of the Americas were crypto Jews. Um, the, uh, the, um, the 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 I graduated, uh, I graduated rabbinical school, I was ordained at the Jewish Theological Seminary, 
which was founded by uh, Sabata Moraes and Herrera Mendes. Uh, they were uh, they were Portuguese Jews, um, and uh, there's really no shortage of, of examples of just this thing. Our media past mayor uh, uh, Eric Garcetti. This is where he's he's a whole bunch of things. He's, he's Jewish. He's Mexican. He's Italian. I know I left something out. And he's got a little bit of he's got a little bit of Native American in him as well. Um, but Jews and Latinos have been working side by side, uh, really, for the last hundred years, um, especially in the area of unions, uh, in, in terms of uh, advocacy for immigrants, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. Of course, uh, you know our our connection, uh, the, the Jewish Latino connection, was literally signed in blood in 2018 when uh, when a person who I will not name uh, looked at the activities of the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. Um, in its efforts to absorb those, uh, in the, is those in the Central American caravans who are seeking asylum in this country. And Hayek is trying to help process them and get them the food they need and, and, and uh, advocate for them. And uh, the sh the, this terrorist saw this, saw this as something satanic and something that should be, that's something sinister. And so he went he went. He picked up. He picked up his AR-14. He went to, into a synagogue in Pittsburgh and murdered 11 people about five years and 11 days ago. Um, so that's 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 where our, our our alliance is literally signed in blood when that happened. And so um, I, I think there. I, I think that uh, there. It, it's of utmost importance that 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 that, that Jews who are sometimes Latino and, and Latino who are sometimes Jewish make common cause and fight off the bigotry uh, of all things. Um, there's a lot of, I mean, a lot of, there's a, as a Jew, um, I have been feeling a little vulnerable lately um, and uh, worried about security, worried about an active shooter, things like that. And I know the, uh, I know the Latino and Hispanic community, are, they're no strangers to these threats. Um, the Muslim community is coming down. The only way we're going to be able to fight bigotry and end bigotry in this country is this, that every everybody comes together and makes common cause and fights bigotry tooth and nail wherever it rears its ugly head. Um, and that's really all I have to say. I think I'm under 10 minutes. Q&A. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. The secretly practicing Judaism, they converted. They were forced by the uh, by the Spanish Inquisition to convert to, to convert Christianity, but they were secretly practicing Judaism. And many of them, so the cartographers, the crew of all these ships, of the Spanish Armada, including Christopher Columbus himself. Okay. All right. So uh, now is the second. Um, um, the second uh, guest is my mother, Hebe Belfort. Please the audience, please. Yes, this is my name. Well, that's my first. I always, everybody knows me by Isabel. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the reason why I, I am saying these two things is because I became homeless when I didn't expect it. I, I went from California to Michigan to, to retire. I mean, he was going to go to the university. And uh, I got this little home. It was cheaper for me because my husband and I we had a separate apartment. And so uh, we were almost uh, And he was, uh, you know, the winters are very harsh in Michigan. If you have been somewhere up there, any of you. So we started to see that we were getting into that. And I said, I, I told him, you know, because he had he missed semester. Of the, in the winter because my truck would get uh, stuck in, in ice and then uh, for the whole month he couldn't finish. So anyway, we were deciding that we were going to come back. And then so I decided to lease my home to a family that was looking for a place and uh, uh, with the option to buy. And they promised that they would take care of my home while I was away for four and a half months. And then they would, they would be uh, getting uh, the loan or whatever to buy my home. So the last month that I was coming back, that was at the beginning of April, uh, she did not answer my phones, my, my calls. And uh, uh, 
I decided that I would go then and find out what was going on. Okay. We get to the home, go to the house, and uh, my door, my sliding door, you know, it's a, a house with a door uh, upstairs, and the sliding door was open and uh, it was almost very dark. So I called and nobody answered. So I said, wow. Mm -hmm. So I go in and it was a shock of my life. They destroyed my own property. It was from the roof. The roof. We had a we had a new carpet and it was destroyed completely. The roof, the, the refrigerator, everything. And I had a pantry, a long pantry, everything, the whole the whole uh, uh, roof. Oh, I don't know how they did it. But it was in a, it was so shocking. I still I have pictures that I took. And uh, I could not believe it that they did this to me and said, what happened? Here? So I called the police. And the police came and the guy, he was, but that area was mostly, uh, mostly, I think we were the only Hispanic in the Right. Way. It was most of about 99%. Yeah. So the policeman was white. He was a younger man. And he comes and he sees all that. He sees that destruction. And he said, I am so sorry. So he embraced me. And he said, I'm ashamed. So he gave me, I still have his card. He said, we are going to investigate both of these. So I, I went, uh, I also went next day, I went to the uh, social services because I didn't know that she was pregnant and she had a baby. And so to see if they could find her, they could not find the family, two teenagers. So what happened here is that when I go to the home message room, the whole thing. The moment she showed to me, well, you know what? You were selling the house. We didn't know. They are the bandits that you run into your home. They are not bandits. They did not vandalize you in your the house from outside. Somebody that came. You let them stay in your home. We cannot get So I could not get one single penny. I don't know why it was there, you know, because uh, I was helping him to go to the university. So I ended up homeless. So what happened is that I called a lawyer to find out they took up. Nobody here. So what happened is he came here, he went to his father and said, Go to your father and then I'm gonna try to see if I could find my sister. But it didn't happen. So his friend who is a, a Japanese, they were thirteen on when they were starting to be friendly. And he was a student from my university. Uh, he called him and, and then I said, okay, I spoke to him and he said, I'm going to take you around and see what we can do. Because I needed to go somewhere that night. He went to his father, okay, don't worry about me, I told him, I'll be, I'll be okay with uh, Kasu. And so Kasu hit off, brought me to Skid Row, okay? Because he said, the only thing that I think of is that they might have, you know, uh, a place for you. And I said, Steve Rowe. And there were all this bunch of, in Los Angeles, all this bunch of homeless people. And then I said, oh, I can't feel scared. But then I opened, you know, I went to the, we went inside, and then there was a, a, a woman there. And she said, yes, I am going to be guard tonight. And we're going to have a social worker tomorrow. So she can stay here tonight. So thank God, so good to me, that she brought a, a, one of those beds that they have. 150 people sleeping there. And so she brings this, uh, this uh, a small, I don't know how they call it. Anyway, she put me in front of her desk. She said, you want to sleep in front of me? I'm going to guard you. And I said, oh my God. There was a woman there that was screaming, another one over there. And it was like crazy. And so she said, don't worry about it. I'll be here for you. Try to sleep. So in the morning comes the, I went to sleep. The morning comes the social worker. And she talks to me and she said, I'm going to send you to a place so that they can help you for, you know, to get a place. And meanwhile, I was getting my social security return. You know, it, it piled up. I was homeless for six months because nothing else. So what they did, they sent me to this shelter, thank God, it was a good shelter. 
I was a Filipino people, and the other one, it was nuns, the nuns are Catholic Church. So that helped me to accumulate the money that I needed to find an apartment. So Katsuhiro was taking me everywhere to see what I could find. And uh, he said, we cannot find anything. So that was before I got into the church. Then. So what we're going to do, you're going to sleep in the computer room in the Pomona University where he was. So I'm going to give you my student card. And then with my student card, you will be able to go in the morning and take a shower with the girls in the girls' uh, place. And so I did that. Five days, I was sleeping in the computer. Right. I ended up in the hospital because I got swollen. So I only stayed, I, I was there for a couple of days only. I, I, I didn't want him to know what was going on. And I took a so he would don't tell me. Just take him that we still looking for a place. And so finally, thank God, after that, that's when I started to get these couple of places. And so uh, I finally, I found this apartment where we are in Glendale. I knew, and it was very, it was very dramatic for me. I knew that I wouldn't have a house anymore. So I am living in an apartment. We are living in an apartment. So he's trying to, to see. So when, when finally he comes with me, uh, to live here with me, um, he says, Mom, you know what? This problem with the homeless <clears throat> is so big that you ended up homeless. I said, wait a minute, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I think it's a good experience because now I understand what the homeless are. The majority of them, they don't want to be out there. Many of them. It's for different reasons that they end up homeless like it happened to me. And then I, I, I spoke with some people. There was this Mexican um, uh, uh, couple that were, you know, standing uh, in this place. And I said, why are you looking? Because it, they were kind of disoriented. And then they told me, well, we came here because my daughter sent for us because we have her, uh, she had a baby. And we came here to, to be with the baby and her, but she threw us out of the house. And now we don't know what to do. I want to go back to Mexico. And I said, oh my God. So I said, look, this is what I'm going to do. So I gave them the, the place where they could go to a social worker, but uh, to a social services. But I couldn't give, a, give them anything. You know, that was, I was homeless too at that time. So I hope that they, I said, they might help you to get the money so that you go back to this. So, and then afterwards, Ricky said, Ma, we are going to help them. So this is how we started to come in this. We have been doing it for... For so about three years. For about three years. In a row, but before that, every 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 time we saw somebody, mm -hmm. we do something, yes, or, or money or whatever. And I don't have that much money, and then right now, because of my fall, I fell, uh, he stayed, he's like home taking care of me with the sick. So um, the homeless people that we have gone, yeah, there's two videos. He's got videos here, and there's they're only a minute, issue. so it's gonna be quick. Yeah, so it's a funny issue. Well, thank you so much. We're gonna show two videos. We're gonna show. Sure. Thank you so much. We'll keep in touch. Yes, please. So um, we're gonna we're gonna show uh, two videos. They're gonna be like a minute long, where we helped two uh, groups of homeless people of different backgrounds. Uh, one group of people were under a bridge in Eagle Rock, and the other group were in, uh, I believe, was close to the uh, North, Northeast Los Angeles area. So this is pretty much an example of, of what we Now I'll explain a, a, a little bit of you know, what's going on. Yeah. 
United. You can see here. Bringing supplies. We get donations from some of the people. We get toys and whatever. So this was a lucky visit that were under our fridge at the Nintendo Pico Box Border, posted out there. So it was about Smash United to us, helping the people. So as you can see, me and my mother, we are bringing uh, supplies. And the people on the right, you see this like a couple, um, they had told us that they had been on the street for about five years. Um, the husband, I think, lost his job, he got injured, and he also was a car and lost his babies, and because of the lack of rent uh, they weren't able to get a place to live. So they were explaining their financial situation. And there was another one, which is a lot. Gentleman right here. He's been on the street for 20 years. So, so you're welcome. A lot of these people have different uh, circumstances of why they don't have this. And pretty much it has to do with primarily with lack of rent control. There is really no social safety net. And at the same time, uh, people don't have access to a lot of services. So, in many cases, for a lot of these people, what we provide is like their only hope because many of these people don't have a car. Many of them cannot go to certain places to get distances. So we try to do an intake with different people where we get their information and try to refer them to services or to places where they can go because, you know, many of them, even those that are American born citizens, especially if they're not from the state, they don't know where to go. So that's one group of people. But luckily, these people that you saw here in the video, we were able to assist them in getting them into the tiny, tiny homes that are in Eagle Rock, and that's the reason why you don't see them under the bridge anymore. So we were able to help these people get housed. So we're going to show the second video. This was another group of people where I think it was in northeast Los Angeles, which is close to the Eagle Rock Pasadena border. So I'll show you that. <laughs> Yeah. Hello everyone, we have supplies, if anyone wants to take some, come, feel free to come and uh, get some bags, fill the supplies and everything. Yeah, yeah, it's not a problem, you too. Take care. This was oh, there's somebody else coming. Or in the north, in the north part of the yeah, right. there's two more. Uh, people the majority of people that we spoke to here. Take care. Have a good day. The majority of the people they spoke to here, the majority of them, they were not mentally ill. They were not drug addicts. They were not alcoholics. A lot of them were working class people. Many of them were working while being homeless. Because another stig a stigma that people have of the unhoused is that they're either mentally ill, uh, drug addicts, alcoholics, or they just want to be back ones, as people say. And there are many cases where you have people that are mentally ill, that are alcoholics, that are not getting treated. In <laughs> cases, a lot of the people that we have interviewed and the intakes with are working class people, many of them are families. Uh, different circumstances. I even spoke uh, to a person, he was a business owner. I think he was selling like, uh, medical supplies. Independent for the citizen. He got sick and he wasn't able to take care of himself and he didn't have any family. He ended up on the street, someone that is educated. So um, the whole point is that we need to humanize the homeless people. We need to, we need to humanize people that are vulnerable because right now, many people are suffering because of the economy. Uh, the lack of rent control is just out of control. That's one of the reasons why I will say a good, maybe a good 60 or 50% of uh, the homelessness cost today has to do with the lack of rent control. We have, credit, we have predatory landlords that take advantage of no rent control and decide to raise the rent, let's say, from $1,000 to $5,000 overnight. They end up on the street. It doesn't matter if you work 10 jobs. It's impossible to pay a huge spike 
you know, let's say you're paying thousand dollars, you know, for twenty years, all of a sudden the landlord said, you know what, I'm going to raise the rent to five thousand dollars. You know, that is something that does happen. So many people end up homeless not by choice. And the fact that many people in our society tend to judge, tend to criticize, and tend to demonize and stigmatize a lot of homeless people. So in many cases, a lot of uh, people that become unhoused end up abused. Not necessarily by other homeless people, but by people, you know, that see them as a scum of society. And I witnessed that many times. So I feel there needs to be in a, an awareness that we cannot judge or criticize or stigmatize why people end up homeless. Because like my mother said, you know, we don't know their background. My mother has always been a productive member of society. She's a retired teacher. You know, bad luck in life, we lost our only home you know, because we always lived in houses. And uh, I myself was kind of not 100% homeless, but I was kind of homeless in a way because even though I was living with my father, it was like my father was not involved in my life. And uh, I spent most of my day in the Jewish community uh, over in Fairfax. That's when I became a belt of and It was uh, within the Orthodox community that kept me from going the same. I was going through a very difficult situation at that time, and and during and during the uh, evenings I would come home, and in the weekends I would see my mother, and my best friend, and we do we try to do what we could to try to find funds to get the house in the today. So, uh, you know, homelessness can happen to anybody. So, you know, Spanish United, you know, this is where we come and try to help these people that many cases don't have any resources or don't know where to find resources. A lot of them are in Spanish. Even though we help people of all backgrounds, because you know, Spanish United, we are a nonprofit organization. We help all those regardless of race within our background. And uh, we try to do what we can to serve the community. Me as a, as a social advocate, you know, my job is to serve the Hispanic community and to serve the homeless community and to serve those that are and that's pretty much it. Great. So to, to, um, to conclude the uh, conference, does anyone have any questions or answers? Anything? Can I accept any donations oh. today? I'm sorry? Can I accept any donations? Yes, we're accepting donations. We're accepting cash, check, PayPal, Cash App, whatever you, you want. Have, you have the I yeah, yeah. Yes, we have so the I have the I N. So my mother money. has the I N and the tax like, information. So anyone who wants to donate, Spanish United, all proceeds uh, goes to helping some of the community, and you can write it off from your from your taxes. Anybody else? So is that the point of for donations or no? It's right here. Oh. Still have some time for. You guys to get some coffee there. Uh, would you like to make a comment? Um, okay. I um I wasn't expected to make a comment, so I will talk. Um, I think the need for both of the communities to come together, and I think um, what the other rabbi had to say was something that most people don't know, is that there is a long history of um, Judeo-Hispanic culture in America. And um, actually, the first casualty of the American Revolution was a man by the name of Francis Salvador, who was a, a Latino uh, immigrant, Jewish immigrant. To it. But I think more than that, I think we both face discrimination. And I think there's a whole thing that we can do together. And I think bringing the communities together, um, faith-based and otherwise, is important. And I think the time has come. And I know, and as far as my community is concerned, that we want to do what we can, um, I will be going back to the congregation and just speaking uh, toward helping, certainly helping the homeless. Um, I'm, I'm you know, impressed with Enrique, and we've done a couple of podcasts together, and so I hope that we can get it off the ground, and um, pretty much, I mean, I, you know, the greatest reading, I think, is not in Hebrew, and that's the language, but it's in Spanish. I think when you say to someone, Vaya con Dios, go with God, 
is the most beautiful thing you can say to somebody. So I hope we all will go with God, and I hope that God will be with us. And now it's at the beginning, and just like a, a tree, we have roots, and now we will build it into a wonderful, wonderful um, growth. And, and may the fruit bring that we bring people home and give them a place to live and a place to be together. And I hope for the future that both communities can come together and then you know, we'll use your, your knowledge of podcasts and stuff to, to plead with people to come. And um, more than that, um, I don't really have you know much more to say. I'm glad to be here, glad to be at the beginning. And I, and I once again, I think we need to get to know both communities and find out what the depth of both communities are. Because, like Enrique says, um, the roots of both communities um, are, are much deeper than you think. I'm thinking about, um, and this is not a plug, but I once did Ancestry.com. And no, my, my roots didn't show up any, uh, I was hoping, but didn't show any Latino roots. But my wife is from Iran, and I do so 3% of Persian roots, which made her very, very happy. Um, but I think none of us know exactly where our ancestors have been. And I think amongst the crypto Jews, um, if I, do you mind? I mean, now you've got me started. Do you mind? <laughs> uh, sure, you know, okay. if you want. Go you know, ahead. No, no, I'm, I'm giving a class on Tuesday, and it's called Jews of the West, and the first class is on crypto Jews. And you're welcome. We're Beth Emmett, um, Buena Vista, and Clark, but this is not a plug. But there was a big controversy over crypto Jews, whether they were really part Jewish or not. And there was an argument between a historian from New Mexico, whose name escapes me, versus a historian from Texas, whose also name escapes me. But then they uncovered a gene that's a mutant gene amongst the Hispanic women of New Mexico. And um, I can't remember the gene. It is a gene found in the Jews of Europe. It is a gene that brings breast cancer. And so this one historian in New Mexico said, see, I told you, but it does make a point. We don't know where the Jewish people have been. We know that they were, they were hidden because it made it easier. We also know that there are large land grants given by the Spanish government if the conquistadors and their soldiers would in fact stay in the new world. And they did what young men do. They wrote home and said, send me someone to marry. And amongst the crypto Jews, they sent cousins. And they got married. So for, for 1,500 to now, 500 years, they've been doing their Judaism secretly. Uh, I only bring it up because I just want to make sure that both communities know to respect both sides. And once again, you never know where your ancestors have been and you never know where. So from our perspective, it's time for us to open our arms too, because too many of us look at Eastern Europe as the only place where Jews were, and that's just historically absolutely false. Uh, and so I hope for all of us, we will go together. I also know amongst my, my Hispanic Catholic friends, Jerusalem is as sacred to all of you as it is to me personally. So let us hope today of all days that we speak for peace for them and for peace for our communities. And once again, loyal con Dios, may you all go with God. Anybody else have any questions or comments? I'll give some comments really quick. Sure, go ahead. No worries, I'm gonna come over here. So, Enrique, I think we've known each other for five plus years, something around that? Yeah, about. My name's Benjamin, Benjamin, Benji is what my friends call me. I belong to Chabad of Poway, but I'm often up here doing activism. And why is that? Well, half of my family is Jewish from Iran. We're Kurdish from a place called Kermat Shah. It's inside of Iran. And then the other side of my family is from Havana, Cuba, Jewish as well. So, you know, there's a lot that I could talk about about my own life. My grandma, her family comes from Iran. They become the ones that survive Holocaust survivors out of Poland. My grandma's name's Francis Gilbert. Um, and then on my grandfather's side, he grows up in you know a small um, Jewish barrio, like a small Jewish community, and um, is very much proud of being a Jew in 
um, a socialist military school as a kid. And this was a time where, um, not to say that socialism is a way, but this was a time where there was a little more tolerance. This is 1924 when he was born in Cuba. And he had a relationship with the people on the island where he was no different than any other Cuban. Although um, you could say he, he looked different and there's three ethnicities in Cuba. There is Spaniard, there is, um, of course, the Hispanic Latino people, and then there is Polaco. Polaco, it means Polish, but everyone who's Eastern European in Cuba is Polaco. It doesn't matter if you're from Germany, it doesn't matter if you're from you know, Greece, you're Polaco, no matter what. So my grandpa going, growing up as a Polaco, he changed his name, the whole family, to Garcia rather than Gelbart because that wouldn't work, especially being that my grandfather was a professional baseball player in Havana. He was playing on the Latin American team, and this is how he ended up making his way to the States because the Detroit Tigers made a phone call and said, hey, we want that kid who won the Pan American Games. So my grandfather makes his way to the United States, marries um, my grandma, who's a Holocaust survivor of Kurdish-Iranian descent, and um, here I am. So in my day-to-day -day life, I try to do activism as much as I possibly can about, of course, bringing people together as Enrique does, but I do it from a little bit of a different angle. As much as um, you know, people will ask me, where does your family come? And that's complicated because I already told you about my dad's side. My mom is a convert to Judaism and she's Native American. So I wanna, I wanna see not only through my Jewish community, the acceptance of other communities, whether you're Sephardi, Mizrahi, Ashkenazi, whatever you are, Maybe you're, um, you could be from a crypto background, which again, many people still don't recognize, they don't understand. And some people don't want to understand due to you know, our complexities with halakha or the, the way we see who's allowed into Judaism, if you will. Right. So at the end of the day, that, that's my biggest struggle. I wanna talk about the missing Jewish people of the world who are coming back. Our tribes are coming back, we're finding each other. And it's time that we really learn about each other and uh, accept each other at the end of the day. Because if we don't do that, if we don't accept each other, I think it's pushing us further into galut, which means exile. So exactly. that this is my point of being here. And I'm really appreciative that you invited me, Enrique. And I'm happy to uh, talk with anybody later today. I always do activism. I've led the largest Iranian and Cuban protests here in Los Angeles with hundreds of thousands of people. Um, I mostly stick to the... Cuban stuff nowadays, but that is very hard because we have an extremely small Cuban community here. They were gentrified many years ago, right. moved out to uh, Las Vegas mostly, and we, in the Cuban community, for whatever reason, we're not really talking to other Latin American and Hispanic peoples or Spanish speakers. In my community, Enrique, your community, because you're Cuban as well, we oh, need Puerto to- Rican. Puerto Rican, okay. My mom was married to a Cuban. Oh, then that, that's where it is, okay. Well. But my half-brothers are Cuban, so I so have half-brothers. Half half-brothers, you're grafted in. I mean, my community, we need to reach out to more Hispanic, Latin American, Spanish speakers because um, we're isolated. As much as we want to say Cuba Libre, it doesn't matter if we're saying Cuba Libre to a wall and then all the other you know, Hispanic, Latin American people don't understand how that if Cuba is free, that this will actually positively affect every other Hispanic, Latin American place and region. So they always say that Puerto Ricans and Cubans in the United States are the two most vocal Hispanic groups in this country. Puerto Ricans being U.S. citizens and Cubans being refugees. And I feel that if both work together, they could be leaders in the Hispanic community. So again, so, thank you so much, man. Which is gonna Are you uh, Armando? Nope. Um, Ronald. Ron oh, Ronald. Ah, I, I did not recognize you. This is Ronald, this is uh, the headmaster of the Rabbit Academy. I did an interview with him a few years ago. Would you like to give any comments of anything uh, before we conclude? I really wasn't prepared for any comments for the most part. Uh, well, on the, on the fact of education, I was speaking about education earlier. So uh, as we spoke a couple of years ago on the podcast, like, what can Hispanic parents do in providing like a better education in terms of private education? So. If they're looking for private education and uh, depend on the incomes of the people, wherever you go for private education, you have to pay and you have to figure out how you do the uh, 
how you're going to do the payments. So usually what we do is we give a, a, a height of the amount of payments that the parents have to make. Uh, and then if they make more than that, uh, they don't get as much uh, of a dis discount, basically, on the education. Education runs us uh, about uh, 22000 per year per, per, per person. So what we do, uh, it's our own, my own property, my own business, I own the whole thing. So what we do, I used to be an attorney and got rid of that after a while uh, and went on to teach and to do different things. And um, so we give uh, part of our, uh, our income from the school to the people that cannot afford it. So it depends on what it is. So you can get up to 50% uh, discount uh, depending on what it is. Uh, if they're looking for something like that, that we have availability for them, but uh, it's a different type of school. We do not teach um, anything to do with things that are out there alone with uh, transgender or people doing any other things. It's a straight school. It's uh, math, English, history, uh, science. It's just academics. It's academics, and so you don't get into the uh, the arguments that you have all over the place that right. I see nowadays uh, more than anything else. If the parents want them to know about something that we would consider something we wouldn't teach at the school, it's up to the parents. Right. We're not going to go into the subjects that are going to be uh, that are going to be provocative to where they're going to get to. The, they're going to. Uh, have arguments and, yeah. be, and be distracted, basically. Basically, it's a distraction of it, because what you're looking at when you're going to a school is you're looking for a community that you can believe in and go along with, and they're going to teach you what you need to know to get into college, because it's right. a college prep school, so you're there, and you're learning the things that you need to do that, uh, that will go into college, uh, so you will get into the schools that you're looking for more than anything else. So that's a little different. Uh, yeah, because I because I feel that education is something that is vital for Hispanic people to move out of poverty. But if I may, yeah, go ahead. I'd go I'd go a different way. You have a large cadre of I'm a 35 year LA Unified School District teacher. I have a life credential in special ed and in social studies. And I'm not look. I don't mean to blow my own horn, but I'm I'm one of several retired teachers. And I think the Hispanic community, maybe we should lead it, would be to send out a call to retired teachers willing to give up a couple of hours a day to tutor. Um, first of all, we work cheaper than regular teachers because we have our medical benefits and we have things. But I know I'd be willing to give a couple of hours, a couple of afternoons a week to go and tutor and go and work. On, on things, and, and if there's any special ed, uh, I did that. But I, I speak for my friends. Some of them are members of the congregation, but some of them are just friends of mine from LA Unified. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, if that's where you want us to go, I'll make some phone calls. I can't guarantee they'll say yes, but I for sure, everybody knows somebody else. Of course. And they might add into it, but you'll have all these people who retired in their 60s who were lifetime teachers, who were willing to tutor the school districts of pain and, um, I'm a rabbi, I can't say that. They're not nice. They make you go through everything with hoops. Right. In fact, you have to get re fingerprinted. 35 years, you have my fingerprints. They're not firm, basically. They're exactly, not they're not. So we could work out people in the secular, I'm not even talking about the religious stuff, the secular things to make inroads with the Hispanic community um, I, I've believed it for a long time that we have all these retired teachers who are basically, I was almost willing to do the tutoring. It's like, you know, the old joke, you can take the teacher out of the classroom, but you can't take the classroom out of right. the teacher. Exactly that way. So maybe we should talk about it. Absolutely. You know, and I mean, let me give I mean, another, stuff uh, another comment. No but, when, I was, when I was going to uh, high school and junior high school, uh, 
the education started to go down back then. And one of the things that I always thought that was very detrimental for many, for many of the students was the lukewarm, the lukewarm attitude of many students. I mean, uh, many teachers, I'm sorry. And that attitude is, if you graduate, great. If you don't graduate, that's great too, because you know what? I'm gonna get my pension. And many of them would have a very cynical demeanor or attitude towards many of the Hispanic students. You know, they would look at them as, you know, Cholos, Sereños, gangbangers, you know, they're, they're, they're going to be nothing productive in society. And many of them that were productive, that wanted to move up, it's like no one gave them the special, I wouldn't say special treatment, but they wouldn't give them uh, encouragement. And I feel that if there are more teachers that are willing to donate their time, volunteer, uh, to help these students, that not only will these students graduate, the same time, it will help many of these Hispanic students from not getting into gangs, getting into trouble. Because I've spoken to many um, students that uh, got into trouble, and some of them that are adults that have gotten into trouble. You know what they told me? The reason why I became a gang member or a drug dealer or whatever, because I didn't have a teacher that cared about me. The teacher cared more about his pension than caring about my education. And I said it, and I, think, I remember that I said it when I spoke to you on the podcast that that the uh, many of many of the school systems have gotten so politicized in the sense that they always want to put blame on, on, on each other. And I've always said it before: if you want to make the students graduate, the teachers and the students and the principal and the school board must work together. It is not the teacher's job to make sure that the kids with their homework when they go to school, and it's not. And, and it is not the, um, the parents' job to make sure that their kids are learning in school. So they have to work together. And I think that in order to get that to go, is that there needs to be like a form of penalty. Like in many countries, if a student doesn't graduate on time, the teacher gets penalized. So that will encourage the teachers to emphasize on the students to graduate. And I feel that if we were to do that in the public school system, I think we will prevent a lot of dropouts. We will uh, prevent uh, a lot of students from, you know, getting into trouble. At the same time, they will feel that they are cared for because I feel that many students don't want to go to school, especially in the Hispanic community. But they feel that, why am I going to go to school? The teacher, the teachers don't care about me. They see me as a loser. They see me as a parasite. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go gangbang and deal drugs and not be productive. And that creates a cycle of poverty, mass incarceration. And it also stigmatizes the Hispanic community. Like, let me give you another quick example. I started Spanish United three years ago because there was a situation of a of a 18 year old uh, Hispanic uh, young man by the name of Andres Burado. He was working at a very rundown uh, car shop in Gardena as a security guard. I don't know if he was on documents or not, but the police decided to go there and mess with him, and he was scared. So he ran off, and then they shot him. They killed him. It was horrible what happened to this young man, because this young man was working two jobs. He was studying to become a doctor. But one of the things that really bothered me was the horrible comments, the horrible comments that people said about this part on social media. Because they stigmatized him because he was Hispanic, he was brown. They said, you know what? He was probably a gangbanger. He was probably part of MS-13. It was probably this and this and that, without even knowing. They were judging him just because he was Hispanic and he was brown. They didn't think, you know what, maybe he was going to school, he was being productive. No, everything the stereotype is negative. So that's why I made the initiative to start Spanish United to break that stereotype because the stereotype of the Hispanic people in our country is very bad. I've seen it. I've experienced it. I myself was a victim of a hate crime a couple of years ago, like neo-Nazis that almost killed me. And there is a hatred towards Hispanic people that has been common. And uh, I feel that if we educate our young people and tell them that there are better ways of having a better life without having to resort to doing drugs or, or doing illegal things, I think that's going to help the image of the Hispanic community, but it cannot be done alone. So that's one of the reasons why I feel that we need to uh, do workshops. Like, I want to do workshops in different parts of the country once we get more established 
to educate the Hispanic people, especially the parents, that if you want to keep your kids out of trouble, you need to be involved. You know? And that's my, my conclusion. Okay? Thank you so much. So, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was trying to, I was saying to Barry. Because you know, I didn't. I had not changed. No, her. no, it's five thirty. I had not changed it. We have time. And I was telling her, and she, she would not go. <laughs> she had not. So when it does, she yeah. did not fall yeah. back. Yeah. On and the I clock thought, and the watch. Don't worry about it. It's and fine. I it's gonna be okay. Hey, but I think we were able to cover Sorry. everything with uh, one stop. Yeah, good for everybody. Okay, <laughs> Sorry. Thank you so much for making it, Rob. I really appreciate it. Please serve yourself quality and, and good, uh, you know, great presentation. Very nice, uh, good, great. Uh, I can shake your hand. Uh, Muchas gracias. Great. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. That's a wrap.